Buy my novel, Escape from the Village, from major booksellers online. Go to escapevillage.com. Subscribe to my Substack. Go to fountainheadforum.substack.com. Thank you. Welcome to the party, pal. This is Fountainhead Forum 69. I am talking to the one and only star child who has been very active with the Libertarian Party for uh, about 30 years, I guess. And uh, he's a lo- longtime activist who's certainly, if, if you've been to, uh, you know, an LP convention in California or LP national, you probably know who this guy is. Uh, he's uh, certainly a well-known activist who's uh, been fighting the good fights for a long time. How are you doing, Star Child? All right. You, Chris? Yeah. Uh, so, you know, I want to, uh, so how'd you uh, get into the LP? How'd you become a libertarian? Uh, well, it was um, it was a gradual thing. I uh, had been evolving in my views anyway. I grew up conservative, actually, which surprises some people who know me because I sort of am perceived, I think, as being more on the left, although I would just identify myself as libertarian and anarchist now without adjectives. But uh, I grew up conservative. I was a Republican activist before I was a libertarian activist. And... Um, I just from a young age, I started uh, reading early. I was reading a lot of stuff. I, I was into like a lot of kids' history and battles and pirates' adventure stories, stuff like that. And I think um, at some point, I started thinking more about like, okay, well, what's behind these conflicts? You know, what what really uh, matters here? What's the bigger picture in terms of the ideas? And uh, um, so I had a, I think, a well developed sense of. Uh, I guess I would call it social justice. Uh, before I became libertarian, I was very anti-communist. I saw the U.S. government at that time as a force for good in the world and wanted it to roll back, uh, you know, communism and oppression around the world, uh, fight for people in countries where there were serious human rights abuses and liberate people. Um, and at uh, some point along the way, uh, Ayn Rand, you know, people say it starts with Ayn Rand. That was uh, one factor for me. Um, then, um, yeah, it, it uh, at some point, you know, a, a light bulb kind of went off with the, the non-aggression principle um, where it just like, okay, you know, this really makes sense. It's like a unifying uh, field theory, I call it, for the political side of things that just be better to have public policy based on non-aggression and uh you know never looked back although it's taken me a while to identify as anarchist for a long time i thought well i'm not an anarchist because i wouldn't push murray rothbard's hypothetical button if i could have it overnight and i still wouldn't i I think you know that would just be chaos and the power vacuum that would immediately be filled by some new statist entity but uh you know the, the road to anarchy leads through limited government i think is a fair fair thing to say but i i do feel like that's the most consistent application of libertarian principles um is is no external government self-government yeah uh, so yeah yeah well the book is the book is called it usually begins with ayn rand by jerome too silly but yes uh so so what is your definition of anarchy or anarchism or anarchist well you know i used to say strictly no government that that is the definition and I, I've moved um, beyond that, I think. Um, this is uh, kind of a point of contention. A lot of people who call themselves anarchists, uh, still to my mind, a lot of them are not necessarily anarchists because they want things that they can only achieve really through governmental type coercion. Like they'll want to abolish all money or all hierarchy, you know, all wage employer relationships um i don't i don't believe in those things but i do believe very strongly in anti-authoritarianism that goes beyond simply not having government i think to a large degree government is as government does um in the world right now that we live in things entities are pretty clearly either classified as governmental or non-governmental and there's only a few things like the Federal Reserve that are kind of quasi-governmental where it's like, well, is it really part of government or isn't it? Most things, most 
institutions are clearly in one category or the other. But I, I tend to think that that actually may be just kind of a social aspect of where things are right now rather than some sort of a natural law. Um, I don't know that, that really there is sort of a clear delineation there that there may appear to be. Um, you know, certainly a lot of groups from homeowners associations to corporations uh, can act in very authoritarian and controlling ways. Even families within families, patriarchs, so forth, uh, can act in very controlling ways like governments. And um, and I, I tend to oppose this, you know, all the way from, you know, Lenore Skenazi talking about free range kids. I'm very much down with that. I favor minimal well, I wouldn't say minimal, but a um, relatively hands-off freedom respecting approach to parenting and yeah. a relatively uh, freedom hands-off approach to schooling. Uh, the Sudbury schools, I went to a Colorado LP convention one time where they had a, a panel uh, discussion with some uh, faculty and students and parents uh, who involved in the Sudbury school community there. And for those who haven't heard of Sudbury schools, uh, they started in Sudbury, Massachusetts was the first one. Uh, but there's, I think, dozens of them now, I think, in the United States, maybe internationally. I'm not quite sure. I can't remember that. But um, it's like a Montessori school, except more extreme, where the kids are really in charge. They they pass, you know, rules for themselves at the schools. They decide how they want to spend their days. Uh, the adults are just there kind of to facilitate and help them figure out, you know, how to, like, if they want to do something there's one girl there who was really into horses, as a lot of young girls are, and they, you know, kind of helped her, but she she did all the work herself, but, uh, you know, getting her a, a job, um, you know, kind of interning, working at a, a stable where she got to work with horses, uh, things like this. So the kids really choose their own educational path, and whatever they're interested in, they can study yeah. with. So, sorry, and, that was a roundabout answer. <laughs> yeah. And the kids learn how to organize themselves. I mean, certainly when you see kids playing sports or something like that, if if kids ever play sports, at least play just pick up sports anymore. But oh yeah, I mean, I think naturally kids are drawn to play and they, they want to run around and be active. I mean, yeah, the idea of having kids forced to sit in a classroom for eight hours a day, you know, when they're like five, eight, ten years old is, is kind of crazy and there's no surprise that there's resistance to that. Oops. Uh, sure, just uh, Sudbury schools they're called, uh, S-U-D-B-U-R-Y. Um, the first one was in Sudbury, Massachusetts, that's where the name comes from, but they're they're kind of like Montessori schools, but uh, more, um, even, even more uh, independent learning oriented. Uh, the children are in charge of the schools. Uh, they set the school rules, um, you know, have school governance. They decide how they want to spend their days uh, on, on an individual basis. Uh, each student can choose what they want to focus on learning. You know, uh, in theory, they could spend all their time playing video games, but uh, that doesn't actually seem to happen in practice. When you give kids the freedom, uh, they actually do want to explore and learn about different things. And the adults are just kind of there to help facilitate that uh so yeah i think anarchy uh we we in the movement i think in some ways need to think more about uh are the institutions that we're setting up like especially the libertarian party which i still regard as very important to the libertarian movement even though it's been going through some problems and serious issues the past year uh, a lot of controversy and divisiveness but um it may still, I think still is probably the largest single libertarian organization in the world in terms of the number of people involved with it. You know, there's lots of think tanks out there, lots of groups uh, doing good work from the Institute for Justice, one of my favorites, to, you know, Institute for Humane Studies, uh, teaching students about liberty in the classroom and, uh, you know, ton tons of other groups, but most of them are uh, staffed by a relatively small number of people beyond donors writing checks. They're not really mass participation, activist oriented organizations. And I think it's important to have a mass movement type organizations like that, or at least, you know, maybe one per jurisdiction that acts as a political party. And, and 
gets people involved as activists and is run on a bottom up basis, because that's how we want society ultimately to be run, you know, with individual rights and individuals who are empowered uh, rather than on a top down basis. And, you know, it's kind of like Gandhi said, be the change you want to see in the world. If we're building institutions that are just, you know, hierarchical and top down and few people making decisions with a whole bunch of people just kind of passively contributing funds, that's not really training ourselves to be uh, free, you know, self-governing people in the broader world. Um, that's that's my concern there. Um, and also, I think uh, authoritarian regimes tend to fall in one of three ways. You know, either there's a bloody revolution and that, you know, has uncertain outcomes and often not so desirable uh, path. And then there's some sort of palace coup, which you know, often doesn't replace really the, the ruling power as thoroughly as it should. The way that works best is, uh, you know, large numbers of people getting out in the streets, mass movement, people just occupy public places. Uh, they refuse to shut up or leave or go home until the regime topples. And that that tends to have the best outcome. You know, you can look at things like the people power revolution in the Philippines or the orange revolution in Ukraine or the velvet revolution in Czechoslovakia or just, you know, places where uh, regimes fell as a result of mass popular uprisings. And I think the libertarian movement needs to also try to think about um, preparing, uh, you know, ourselves to be involved in that. And there's, again, three groups that tend to be at the forefront of this kind of uh, popular uprising. There's uh, labor, uh, there's students, and there's political parties. Um, those are the, usually historically, the the groups, I think, that are most um, key. Uh, although sometimes there's others, like in Sudan recently, there's been a uh, professional association of doctors um, played a, a bit, pretty big role, I understand. In Sudan, would that have been, was that South Sudan or because I, I know there was the split recently. Yeah, no, no. That was uh, the overthrow of uh, Omar al-Bashir. Yeah. Uh, the, the North, like not, they don't call themselves North Sudan, but the Sudanese yeah. dictator. Yeah. Well, that's good. Yeah. I, I don't, we don't, we don't hear much about what goes on in Africa, but. Yeah, no, no, there's not enough <laughs> in-depth international coverage in general uh, in this country as far as news sources, you kind of have to seek it out. Yeah, you, you definitely have to seek it out. And of course, and of course, you know, uh, you know, there's not necessarily a lot of people reporting on that stuff in English. So, uh, right. Yeah. I mean, I, I've definitely learned that it's truly hard to know what's going on somewhere if you don't know the language. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I realized with a lot of this stuff, I am getting, you know, just a partial picture and there's there's often interesting things about um culture that you just don't hear about i mean you know i just i learned yesterday actually that uh in south korea apparently i guess it's probably true for north korea as well i don't know but um they they measure age differently um than the rest of the world and and there was yeah. it was in the news because they're taking some step to to change this apparently to be more in yeah. conformity with international standards but in south korea i guess traditionally when you're born you're already one years old and yeah. then you you turn two on the next new year um you know rather than on your birthday so um you know it goes on like that yeah. so there's a discrepancy then with people's biological ages compared to the rest of the world but anyway yeah. Uh, you know, the, well, you know, that's a, that's an interesting concept, too, because, you know, the, the whole concept of zero is a is a is a new development. You know, it, mm. when you when you would when you develop when when, you know, the num the num that there's a number, right. a, a number that represents nothing. Right. Yeah, I guess it, it's sort of a, a mind boggling thing to think like, well, how did you overlook this before that there's a nothing? But. Yeah, I guess uh, Arab mathematicians uh, developed yeah. that. Uh, I think sometime in the first millennium, maybe. Um, I feel like that was it. Maybe the yeah. Hindus and the Arabs, and I know the Mayans also developed also had a zero independently. Okay. Yeah, I mean, completely independent of that. It was just because uh, it was some, it was something to re it was a number you know a number that represented nothing, and of course, eventually, you know, we developed fractions and we developed negative numbers from that. So. It's, uh, yeah. Another interesting thing, kind of similar that I, I learned at 
one point that just kind of astounded me was um, uh, ancient Greeks apparently didn't have a word for the color blue. You know, the sky was just seen as no color. You know, it wasn't seen as, as blue. Wow. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So, yeah. So you certainly have, uh, yeah. So this is very interesting. Uh, so yeah, we'd asked, you know, you, you said, you know, so could you elaborate again on what your definition of anarchy is? Oh yeah. I don't think I really gave you a definition, but yeah, I think anarchy is, um, more than simply the lack of government. Uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's a, a lack of authoritarianism of, uh, top-down uh, rule of, of whatever nature. Um, and I, I think, well, there, there's, I, I mentioned, uh, you know, even, even families can have issues with uh, you know, governmental type behavior. Um, yes. And yeah, this is something that, that, the libertarian movement hasn't looked as much at traditionally. And there's good reasons for that, I think. I mean, in some ways, alternate uh, sources of power, institutions that have power in society represent counterbalances to governments. It's like, uh, you know, you look in the United States at the, the federal government versus the, the state governments. Um, the 17th Amendment that got rid of direct election of U.S. senators um, I think was uh, a move away from freedom, even though nominally it looks like increased freedom. Like, okay, you're letting people vote directly on their their who their senators are now instead of state legislatures voting on electing the senators. Wouldn't that be a good thing? Um, and uh, maybe in you know in a vacuum it would, but in the context, what it did was it transferred power from the state governments to the federal government which was part of an already existing trend that just got worse and worse, you know, where there became a much more powerful federal government in this country and the states became much more subordinate. Uh, and I think that was a bad thing. Um, so sometimes, you know, you might want, um, you know, to have counterbalancing institutions like strong families or strong uh, corporations that are not uh, part of government. Um, but ideally, you know, from an anarchist perspective, um, you don't want any organization to have an exercise authoritarian power uh, in any way. You know, you really want free, self-empowered individuals. Um, I think a key fight for us, for humanity, really, um, coming up, I mean, we're in an information age, so control of information uh, people being able to control their own information, like their own medical records, um, you know, their own uh, identity. And this is one reason that the right for the fight for trans rights is important, I think, and that libertarians should be on the right side of this. Uh, you know, people, I think, rebel at what they see as the illogicalness of letting, well, just anybody can say they're a, a man or a woman or whatever. Uh, and it's not based on any kind of reality that's just, uh, you know, that's throwing science out the window and this kind of thing. But really, when you think about it, like, well, what does it matter whether someone is for legal purposes and um, social purposes, a man or a woman? It's really nobody else's business. It doesn't have any bearing. I mean, if they're going in to get medical treatment or something in a way that is sex dependent, of course, you can give them the treatment that is um, appropriate and I don't think the individual is going to generally object to that. Um, if they do, again, that's, you know, people ultimately have the right even to commit suicide if they want to. So still no problem, right? Um, but in general, it, it doesn't matter for society that there's some need to pin people down and say, oh, well, you're a man or you're a woman. Uh, and that's how it has to be. I think, um, you know, it would be preferable to get rid of all uh, gender segregation certainly by government. I mean, individuals, I think, have the right to discriminate. Uh, voluntary sector, as I call it, instead of private sector, voluntary sector groups have the right to discriminate. Um, you know, but uh, there's no reason for government segregated sports or, um, you know, anything else when it comes to, to gender. Um, but uh, the reason for this goes beyond just uh, transgender people having the right uh, to 
uh, you know, express themselves. It, it, it really is about ultimately our right as individuals to, uh, to, to determine our own identity, our own narratives. Uh, in the future, it may be possible for people to do a lot more, not just to change gender, but potentially even to become almost like a, a different species. And of course, you know, there's going to be pushback on this. There'll be people saying, oh, you have to stay human. You know, you have to be within these boundaries of what we consider to be acceptable to be a human being. You know, you can't have fins and scales and wings and, and this sort of thing. And um, I think the, the libertarian, the anarchist approach is really to say, no, you can be whatever you want to be as long as it's not violating the non-aggression principle. You're not initiating force or fraud against anyone else if you want to look incredibly different. If you don't want to fit into some particular binary anymore, then, then nobody should be forcing you to. I, I think it might make life kind of difficult though, but in what yeah, sense? Well, if you wanted to be, if you wanted to be a, you know, be a mermaid, for example, you'd have trouble walking around or driving a car. Uh, that could be, yeah. <laughs> but who says you have to walk or drive a car, yeah. right? True. Yeah. Well, you know, I was, you know, I just, you know, I just think, you know, some of the difficulties that really, really tall people have, you know, so you'd probably be able to drive a, uh, you might be able to drive a, a water filled car with, uh, you know, some sort of uh, mental controls or something. <laughs> I mean, possibly, you know, technology is evolving. And uh, I, I read a uh, I, David, Brin. sorry, go ahead. You know, I, I don't, I don't want to be a fish, but it would be really awesome if we all had the ability to the ability to breathe underwater, wouldn't it? <laughs> it would, and, yeah. and it would be, I think, even more awesome to have the ability to to change your form at, at relative will. You know, if you want to be you know, have uh, wings and fins and everything today, and wings tomorrow, and <laughs> you know, uh, exist as different uh, different creature in essence on different days. Um, that would be amazing and incredible and i think that would be well well you know, that could, I could create some problems you know if i if i turn myself into star child and then i go rob a bank and then i turn myself back into chris baker uh, <laughs> that's gonna be well and they're gonna just have it on camera well star child rob the bank you know it's but we're yeah well we have better yeah. ways of uh, determining whether it was actually me or not but um yeah yeah, I mean, there's uh, there's always going to be complications, right? But uh, yeah. freedom freedom produces new dilemmas. Uh, new technology produces new dilemmas that didn't exist before. I mean, before the abortion, yes. came along, that wasn't an issue, right? I mean, really, I I I hope we can just you know figure out ways to you know uh, you know prolong the quality of life and prolong life. I that that would you know obviously take the you know. And there are things, you know, possibly with the use of stem cells or things like that, where you can possibly regenerate cartilage if you have arthritis or, or re, you know, some cases, you know, let's say you lose your arm and you can regenerate your arm. Yeah. I mean, there's animals that can do these things. Yes. And, um, as people unravel how those things work and uh, are able to, grow down to the cellular level and, you know, bring those cells in. I mean, we're already using artificial organs from other animals and things. And uh, yes. um, I think uh, the future is going to be strange and more wonderful than almost anybody imagines right now. Um, but uh, there are some, you know, people imagining pretty radical things and, and making predictions. There's a, a great book by uh, Ray Kurzweil called uh, The Singularity is Near that I um, encourage libertarians to check out as a, a you know, one glimpse maybe of, of some of the stuff that's going to be coming down the pike. Um, How do you spell that name? Kurt Kurzweil. Kurzweil. K-U-R-Z-W-E-I-L. Okay, yes. Yeah, Kurzweil, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he um, he's not libertarian. Uh, he works, I believe he still works for Google. He's a futurist. Um, uh, but I think very, very optimistic in, in terms of uh, human progress and, and in, 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 you know, in an individual empowering kind of way. That's kind of his vision, I think. But I think he just underestimates the potential for governments, authoritarians to fuck things up. 
Um, you know, I, I don't think he's uh, cautious enough uh, or, or I guess, um, concerned enough about that uh, possibility. Uh, that's, to me, his blind spot that I noticed in reading that work. But he goes into great detail about uh, different fields from medical to information technology and the, the arc of progress and, and kind of his thesis is that everything really is accelerating. And uh, the concept of the singularity, um, which a singularity is kind of like an event horizon, like you're yeah. looking down the road or down a stream and there's a waterfall up ahead and you can't see past the, the edge of the waterfall because it does something so different uh, from the plane that you're in. And um, yes, he estimates the singularity as happening uh, as soon as like 2045 was his guess when he wrote this in 2007, I think it was. Uh, and that being the point, you know, kind of at which uh, maybe we have general AI or something that's uh, a game changer so radical that really everything that came before that looks completely different. Um, that, that life just changes so radically um but uh you know ultimately he's looking at sort of a, a human or transhuman future at which uh people in at least informational terms kind of fill up the um fill up the universe uh reorganizing matter and and all kinds of wild stuff um and it's it's hard to envision like yeah what life would look like as individuals in uh, a universe with that kind of um, technology or where humans have done that. But um, it's, uh, yeah, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what else to add there really. Uh, just, I think that libertarians should be prepared for um, radical change and, and, you know, stay true to our principles. I really do think the non-aggression principle is, is key and fundamental and, and hopefully humanity will will be more and more moving in that direction of, of realizing and embracing this. I, I do think that in the big scope of history, even as dark and dismal as things might seem at the present moment, sometimes um, I think things are going in the right direction overall. You know, there's been human history in some ways has been like an expansion of the idea of rights. You started with the law of the jungle, might makes right. And then kind of move to like the divine right of kings and then, you know, maybe to expanding the rights to the nobility and male property owners and so forth. And, and you know, now we're talking about like, well, what are the rights of children and animals and members of other species and so forth. And, um, you know, so the empathy has progressed, of course, along with that and to some extent been driving that, you know, we've improved in our ability to empathize with others and see things from perspectives beyond our own, which um, might seem a little bit contrary to individualism, but, you know, really, I think our, our rights as individuals are based on awareness, broadly speaking, and empathy is one really important form of awareness. Like, without awareness, you can't really have any uh, respect for the rights of others. You're not going to recognize the other as another reserve, deserving of respect or of having rights. Um, so they, the, I think the rising awareness really goes hand in hand with individual rights. Yes, definitely. I think it's uh, interesting. You know, I'm reminded of uh, what Ayn Rand said is civilization is the process of setting men free from men. Mm. You know, and, and I also think there's a, a, a Safed, Safedina Moose has said, you know, Civilization is the process of going from high time preference to low time preference. You, you know, you, you, instead of, you know, seeing, instead of just seeing, you know, the next day, you, you learn to see the next year, the next 10 years. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's one advantage, I guess, humans have over other animals. I'm not sure that they've found any other species that um, can really sort of uh, project into the future the way that, that uh, human beings can. I could yeah. be wrong about that, though. They keep finding things that are like, oh, they can do this? Wow. But, yes, they can definitely find uh, a lot of new things to do. I mean, you know, uh, you know, when you know, you, you got started out uh, as uh, I, I do wonder about, you know, you know, we were talking about math earlier. And I think 
math is one of the things where anarchy is truly working. You have all these, you have these laws that are accepted and, but there's nobody saying this is the law and nobody gets punished for disobeying the law. You just, everybody just, you know, obeys the laws, so to speak. One plus one equals two. Not, not sure following you. I mean, I don't, I don't think human relationships have the kind of natural laws that math does. You're not suggesting that, are you? Well, I think maybe we, perhaps we get to a place where there are certain laws that are accepted among human relationships, but obviously there are specifics that may, may be problematic. Well, um, yeah, I mean, I think a lot of it is just figuring out the correct application of the non-aggression principle because there are gray areas and nuances. But I, when it comes to public policy, which, you know, I, by which I mean basically, you know, what should the law say? Um, I, I think that is or should be the guiding principle. Yes. I mean, if you have, if I mean, if everybody accepted the non-aggression principle, would a government, would a would a formal government be necessary? Would I? Well, if everybody accepted it. Yeah, I mean, there's there's, you know, degrees of of acceptance. So it's never going to be sort of like, well, if everyone just says yes to this, then then we're fine. You know, there's always. Um, you know, people are often hypocritical in their behavior or, or ideas. You know, they might believe one thing on paper but do something else. Um, so I don't, I don't think we're we're out of the woods that easily. But um, I do think it would be great if there was kind of that um, shared uh, social consensus. I mean, pretty much today, everybody generally agrees that murder is wrong, even though there's some people that still commit murder, and of course governments do it institutionally when it comes to war and so forth. But yes. there's still a very broad consensus that murder is wrong. We don't yet have that kind of broad consensus around the non-aggression principle, which I hope yeah. we will. Um, but yeah, unfortunately we don't. I mean, you know, the, the whole thing about murder being wrong, okay. Well, yeah, there's this, people say murder is wrong, but then it says, well, yeah, well, why? But then they'll be okay with, say, you know, a war or something like that. Right. Yeah, there's there's so many people that still don't grasp what I think to most libertarians seems like a pretty obvious and uh, fundamental distinction that like, you know, if, if government or some institution is doing something, it doesn't somehow make it morally different than if an individual is doing it. You know, if it's wrong for individuals to steal, then it's wrong for governments, institutions calling themselves governments or acting like governments to steal. It's, um, you know, it's the same the same act. <laughs> Yes, indeed. Yeah. But that that understanding seems to still elude a lot of people, unfortunately. Yeah, it, it does. And I don't I don't really know why it eludes people, but it, it seems to be a connection that some people make and some people don't make. But wow. so yes, yeah. how did you how, yeah, so how did you so so you're you're so you started out as a conservative so you you know you obviously more of the anti-communist stuff so you so were your parents pretty active or not no um my parents were uh traditional you know kind of republicans but not not religious right republicans i didn't grow up religious um and i'm i'm pretty glad of that <laughs> um but uh they weren't really terribly active politically um, my dad is the one who initially introduced me to ayn rand although i didn't read it for some time after that um he he once he had some pretty libertarian instincts in some ways he once said only i think half jokingly that you know the only way he would disown me was if i went to work for the irs <laughs> um so yeah i mean my upbringing was in some ways you know kind of uh yeah i would say they were both fiscally conservative yeah um you know they had kids late in life they're kind of uh you know in some ways children of the depression oh yeah you know so yeah. 
Uh, children of the, yeah, children of the depression. And, and, you know, I think there's also because the, the while I well, and and certainly children of World War II, and because while there was not obviously uh, no real self interest for the U.S. to get involved in World War II, there was still the sense that America did defeat at least one thing that was very very evil at the time. And I think we have that have that image very much put into our heads growing up that we're there to fight things that are evil. It's yeah. And, and in a sense, that's, I mean, one of the things that I like about the values that have sort of traditionally been associated with the United States is that that kind of can do, um, approach to life of, of, you know, not just being fatalistic, which is more associated with like Eastern culture, philosophy in the world. Um, you know, the, the American approach has been, you see a problem, you figure out how to solve it, you know, you make things better. And I, I think that is a, um, a, a good and, and uh, noble quality, but I do resist what I call the nationalist we. Um, you know, people say things like, well, we should yeah. We shouldn't be over there in the Middle East. And it's like, well, I'm not in the Middle East. Are you? Yeah. <laughs> you know, are, yeah. are you talking about the U.S. government? That's not us. You know, I, I do not see myself as as them. I, I resist having any association uh, with them. I, I tell people, um, you know, that uh, the U.S. government and I have a non-consensual relationship, and I don't believe in blaming the victims, uh, saying like, well, you know. If, if somebody robs you and then they go out and, and use that money to, to do something awful, uh, is that your fault because you're robbed? No, in, unless you gave your consent uh, in some way, there's there's no um, uh, culpability there. And I know there are people that say like, well, even by voting, you know, in, in uh, US government elections, you're, you're giving your consent. Um, I, I don't agree with that. I see it as, voting is a form of harm reduction, you know, <laughs> it yeah. doesn't, if, if your robber offers you the choice, like, okay, well, I just took this money from you. Um, you would you rather I, I use it to go out and buy more guns to, to, to kill some people in this murder spree I'm planning? Or uh, would you rather I, I give it to the Salvation Army? Um, you know, if I'm given a choice, I'll vote for the Salvation Army <laughs> expenditure rather than the other one. Uh, it doesn't mean that I uh, have consented to or approve of the initial robbery in the first place. Yes, you know, it's like, uh, yeah. So, yeah, so, you know, yeah, it's like democracy. So, okay, you, you get to vote. You get to vote on whether it's a a bullwhip or a flogger. You know, it's a, <laughs> uh, no, I don't, I don't want either one. Thank you. You know, well. Yeah. And, and we should continue to make clear that, no, this is a false dichotomy. And, and yeah, we really don't want either one. Yeah. Uh, but if you really are, you know, in a situation where you don't have a practical choice beyond, you know, a fixed number of options, then, then I think it's it's reasonable, acceptable to choose the, the least harmful of those options that you're presented with. And that that does not somehow imply moral consent on your part to the the whole basic framework of limiting you to those options yes and i sometimes i wondered d d is is it is there something about that makes it difficult for people to see more than two choices when there's a a, a decision they're facing um i mean you know people always you know it seems as though people think of you know in politics as yeah, well, in some, some cases, cases there maybe, are. Maybe there are three choices, you know. In, in some cases and, there are, and in some cases I think there's, there's you know, understandable, you know, yeah. reasons for that. I mean, the male and female comes up a, a lot, but obviously. There can be three sides, and, and maybe there are three sides, or maybe there are four or five sides, you know. Maybe there aren't just right. two sides. But traditionally in, in you know, in human gender and, and human biology, there there's two uh, yes. genders. And, and so it's, it's understandable in yeah. some ways that people would want to say, or, or would, would believe that, you know, it has to be, you have to be in one of those two. And those are the only options, even though, you know, if they look at other species, they can obviously see examples where there's more gender and they can obviously see people who have more masculine traits and more feminine traits that maybe don't accord so much to the, the gender that they technically belong to. And then there's 
people who are born intersex, you know, where they have indeterminate organs and so on and so forth. Um, so even though there's sort of hints out there that there's really a broader set of possibilities, um, people are kind of conditioned in some way to see there is only being two. Yeah. And not, not everything is binary. I don't know if that, you know, that's just that, you know, well, you know, that's how it works in computers. You know, everything is bi everything is binary, you know, you know, either a, a bit is on or a bit is off. Well, traditionally, again, yes, but now there's quantum computing. So yeah, um, yeah, I'm, I'm not yeah, even there, there's not really a binary or it's not the only possibility. Yeah, but but obviously, you know, binary leads to infinite possibilities because you have two, you have four, you have eight, 16, 32. It's just, you know, that's how you represent numbers. So it's just a different way of representing numbers. Uh, yeah, so you were, uh, so, so you were very much, uh, you know, anti-communist. Were you, uh, were you a fan of Ronald Reagan at the time or? Uh, I was, I, um, I mean, I, you know, not probably on everything. Um, yeah. I was pretty young, but, um, you know, I, I, uh, yeah, I, I, I thought, um, you know, like I said, the, the, and, and sort of having a strong America, um, all these things, uh, the aggressive defense against communism and, and also, you know, fiscal, fiscal conservatism. Um, that part of me was was libertarian in the domestic sphere. I don't really like the word domestic because it again it sort of implies that the nationalist we, but uh, um, you know within the confines of U.S. government uh, control. Yeah, it's certainly. I, 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 you know, it's interesting, but considering how bad it's gotten, it's funny that Reagan actually looks pretty good nowadays. Well, you know who who I think he even looks better, perhaps <laughs> from the current perspective, is Jimmy yeah. Carter, who at the time was, uh, you know, I don't think yeah. a lot of libertarians probably were supporting Carter over Reagan, but but maybe they should have been in hindsight. I don't know. <laughs> well, you know, one thing happened under Carter was the whole deregulation of the airlines and the deregulation right. of trucking. Exactly. Uh, you, yeah. you, know, the, you know, the interesting, you know. I, I don't think there's any question that the, the most popular president in our lifetime was Ronald in our lifetime was Ronald Reagan. I mean, no president was as popular as he was and he was popular when he went out. I mean, and, and he was still very, I think he was still popular, you know, even up to his death. It's uh, I mean, we can well, things have definitely gotten a lot more polarized and, yeah. um, and that's this. This I think led directly, or is one of the factors leading to the Libertarian Party's current problems. Is this polarization has spilled over into Libertarians, where people uh, in our party, in our movement, start feeling like they're really kind of affiliated with one side or the other, and that's bad because if anybody knows the Nolan chart, should know really Libertarianism isn't on the right or on the left. It's it's pro-freedom and anti-authoritarian it's a different axis you know it's it's um it's not on the left right spectrum um and yeah. we have to part of our job i think is is um showing people that the real uh dynamic um of conflict in the world or what's what's important in terms of choosing between alternatives is not between the left and the right it's between freedom and authoritarianism yeah. And both the left and the right have elements of being authoritarian and elements of being libertarian. Um, and, you know, if we lose sight of that, of trying to reorient people to the libertarian authoritarian understanding by, you know, siding with the left or the right and acting like, well, that's our team, um, it, that that totally sets us back and, um, you know, oh, makes yeah. it difficult to pursue freedom, I think, and, and the libertarian movement needs to really keep keep that focus on on the other, uh, the paradigm shift. Yeah, well, I, th I think you I think you just have people who have a diverse area of interest. I mean, if, if, I, if I own a restaurant, I, I'm going, you know, I'm going to want to, you know, I'm going to want to figure out how can I, how can I stop all these damned health department inspections? If I, if I want to, if I need, 
you know, medical marijuana to take care of my, take care of some, some medical issue, then I'm going to be focused on medical marijuana. It's, you know, just, you know, just the same. Yeah, I mean, there's natural sort of human yeah. inclinations and, yeah. and, and there's nothing wrong with people yeah. specializing in or caring oh, yeah. about certain issues, but yeah. I think it, you know, it's good to be able to, to see beyond your yeah. immediate narrow. Oh, yeah. Side. Even that goes back to sort of the overall awareness that is yeah. tied with, I think the evolution of, of rights in, in, um, in, in life generally, I think living organisms uh, achieve rights as they become yeah. aware. And, you know, I'm, I'm a sex worker, but it doesn't mean that I see, you know, I don't think sex work is the most important political issue out there, even yeah. though it's the one that sort of affects me the most directly professionally, the laws against prostitution and so forth. But, you know, um, and obviously I'm for eliminating those laws, but I, I wouldn't say, oh, that's, that's more important than like, you know, getting rid of the, the Federal Reserve or, yeah. Or getting rid of taxes, or getting rid of war, or yeah. these kind of things. Well, you, you know, you'll get you know you know you'll get some liber you know you'll get you know you'll get some libertarians who'll say that the income tax is the most evil tax, and other libertarians will say the property tax is the most evil tax. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah, I, I think and they'll, and they'll both agree that they're evil. They'll just see, see one as being more evil than the other. As long as it doesn't get into, oh, you're defending the less evil yeah. one. I mean, as as long as you're still seeing that, well, all not yeah. consensual mm -hmm. taxation is is theft and yeah. a form of slavery. Um, you know, I think reasonable people can differ as far as which which particular type is more harmful. But you know, we shouldn't get too distracted yeah. with that question either. <laughs> oh well, you know, yeah, but yeah, yeah, but but you know, if you have somebody who's maybe living mostly on retirement income and they, and let's say they're getting all, and all their, they, you know, they have all their IRA money that doesn't get subject to income tax. <laughs> they're probably going to be more interested, but I still got to pay this property tax. But whereas somebody who has a, maybe somebody who has a, you know, who rent, who, who rents their place and, you know, but pays a lot of income tax sometimes. Yeah. I, I do think there does need to be more empathy though. I think rights do come from a place of empathy and I, you know, I, I was out protesting the coronavirus stuff, even though I was not really directly impacted by it. Uh, and and most of the people out there were, you know, well, I lost my job or I lost my business. And it's like, no, I'm, I'm doing fine, but I'm out here because I want to protest this. Yeah, yeah, I, I think it is important to um, look beyond our our, our self interest, and and it gives us more credibility. Uh, yeah, I mean, one of the the charges that libertarians always get is oh we're we're just selfish and you know, Ayn Rand's influence obviously didn't help with that and I I do think that she you know I mean she was brilliant but she had some major flaws and I, I think she was sort of fundamentally mistaken yeah. on um you know downplaying uh I mean al altruism doesn't have to be self-sacrificing in a negative sense it can just mean having a, a broader perspective um, you know, did, did not, not, not only, uh, you know, and, and, and I know it gets, it gets complicated because it's like, well, is, is there really even such a thing as altruism? Uh, is it ultimately all self-interest? You know, you, you do things for others that makes you feel good. Uh, that gets complicated, but I, I think that, um, you know, there, there's the saying that people won't care how much, you know, until they know how much you care. There's, there's some truth to that in, in politics. I, I think if if we can look beyond our our interest and do like yeah, as you did with the coronavirus, maybe you're not at risk uh, yeah. from being negatively impacted by the lockdowns or whatnot. But yeah. you're still ready to stand up, and um, that I think you know to look and see like well who who are the biggest victims of government and society and then really our our focus to some extent should be on on those people like where is government causing the most harm let's side with the underdogs let's side with the victims and i think you know that's that's certainly not the wealthy um you know people who are are wealthy and enjoying fairly comfortable lives are are not doing so bad under the status quo. Um, it may not be their fault. You know, they may not be collaborating with government or or with uh, 
uh, you know, authoritarian institutions in terms of doing bad things to people. They may just have managed to skillfully navigate <laughs> the things that are out there that would uh, cause them harm. But nevertheless, uh, you know, they're they're not the biggest victims. Um, yeah. If, yeah. If you and, really, and really, you know, and really the victims of there, there's a lot less victims of government in America than there is in other countries than there are in other countries. Well, you, I don't know. That gets a little tricky though, doesn't it? I mean, I, well, I mean, well, for example, you know, I mean, well, America has a lot more police shootings than say New Zealand or Australia per capita, but it doesn't have nearly as many as uh, Venezuela. Right. I mean, I, I think, yeah, on any given you know, aspects probably of, of government rights violations you look at, you can find probably yeah. some place in the world where things are worse than the United States with oh, yeah. its duties per capita or percentage of taxation or whatever. Well, the U.S. might lead the world in terms of the, the out-of-control legal system. <laughs> I uh, mean, well, incarceration rate, yeah, that's pretty bad. Yeah, well, I think China's probably worse, but it's hard to know, um, yeah. you know, and, and they don't always... Yeah report honestly about these things so it can be hard to yeah. but, but um i think it's fair to say and, and you know i i like to say that the the number one threat to the freedom peace prosperity and well-being of people in the united states is the u.s government you know the number one threat to the freedom peace well-being prosperity of people in france is the french government you know and and that's generally true country by country around the world yes. Um, you know, <laughs> when yeah. you talk about like enemies, well, who are America's enemies? Like, well, <laughs> you know, the U.S. government is at the top of the list, right? I yeah. mean, uh, well, yeah, maybe, maybe possibly your, you know, your state government like California or your local government. Yeah. Too. And I, 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 when I say you know, U.S. government, I, I'm sort of talking about it at all levels, yeah. even though they're technically different jurisdictions. Yeah, and, and, you know, that's sometimes, you know, libertarians get accused of whitewashing the crimes of other, other governments. And well, no, we, we, we just, our American libertarians get accused of sometimes whitewashing the crimes of other, of other governments, you know, around the world, but that, well, but that's because they don't necessarily affect us and there's not really anything we can do. We can't do as much about them. I mean, well, yeah, I, I differ with that though. Well, I think actually that's a legitimate criticism. True, true. We should be looking at things more objectively. We shouldn't let ourselves be colored by what affects us personally. That goes back to what you were saying earlier, you know, about looking beyond your own self-interest. Yeah. Um, there is too much of a tendency, I think, for libertarians in the United States to overemphasize the evils of the U.S. government as opposed to other governments because those are the ones they perceive as affecting Yeah. Now, personally, and also because I think some libertarians kind of, you know, if they if you see the government as yours in some sense, reflecting you, doing things in your name, you might be more offended or angry when it does things you don't like or things you consider immoral than if some other government that isn't acting in your name or, or using your resources does those things or worse things. But I think if you're really trying to look at things objectively, you know, we have to look at like, well, where are rights actually being violated the most? Where's the most harm being caused? Not just what's worse for me personally. Yeah. Well, 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 well I mean, let, let, you know, let's say 10,000 libertarians all wrote 10 letters, uh, you know, to the, the, the feds or whatever and saying uh, to free Leonard Peltier and free Ross Ulbricht, you know, th those are both men who are incarcerated in America, uh -huh. that that's more likely to be successful than 10,000 American libertarians writing to Putin to tell Putin to free some Russian. Ah, uh, but if you compare it to say, not the government of Russia, yeah. but maybe the government of, of Palau or, uh, you know, Micronesia or something with uh, some low population country, those 10,000 yeah. letters from Americans might well have much more impact on the government there than those 10,000 Americans writing to the U S government to ask for something similar. Um, so I, I don't, I don't really buy the argument like, well, you know, we have to only focus on the U S government because that's the only place we have impact. Um, yeah. no, I don't think that's, that's not really true. Um, uh, you, you, know, can, you you're, you know, the smaller country though, you, you, you could be right about that. I, I think so. I mean, it, it seems it seems pretty self-evident. I think it's also true that, like, uh, 
you know, people could, uh, people, some people, especially on the left, will will say like, well, corporations yeah. aren't accountable. You don't vote for them. You know, you you don't have any influence over them. We need to focus on on government because that's where we have influence. But again, you know, compare that that you know experiment of ten thousand people writing to say the head of uh, you know, General Electric versus the head of the U.S. government, or which is more likely to be effective. But, uh, you know, you can yeah. pool money, crowdfund, and and buy shares in a company to influence them. Or, or you I, know, or or you know, one of my favorites, you know, is you know, if you're if you're, you know, I certainly remember back in 1985 when they introduced new Coke, and all the Coke drinkers said, "We hate this. Bring back the old Coke." And eventually, they did. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. And um, so I, I think the, the, the notion that like, well, voluntary sector, as I call them, institutions are, are not accountable because they're not democratic. They don't have elections. Um, that's, I mean, it's only partly true. There are, you know, often some elections among, uh, you know, yeah. the shareholders and so forth, but also no. it's not the only means of, of influence. Obviously, market accountability is is a major thing, and yeah, and if you those organizations more than it does governments. So yeah, and if you've you know having been worked in a hotel as a hotel receptionist and other things, you know customers are tyrants. You you mentioned you did sex work. Is that right? What kind of sex work? Um, I am a sex worker. That's that's what I've been doing for quite a while. I'm a companion. I, I just wondered if you wanted to go into more specifics on that, or maybe you don't. So um, no, I'm I'm fine talking about it. I'm I'm pretty open. With it. But that's a, but that's certainly a business where you have to deal with customers, <laughs> right? And you want to keep you want to keep your customers coming back. You know you don't, you know, and, and unless your unless your customer is a really really horrible customer, you probably don't want them coming back. But certainly, yeah. Do. Well, one of the things I, that drew me to it is is you know you can be your own boss. I don't have to yeah. see anybody that I don't want to. I yeah. can you know decide my own hours and set my rates and all that kind of thing. Yeah, how how did you get into that? If you... Well, years ago, I was looking for an apartment and uh, met somebody who subsequently became a friend. And uh, at some point, he he was asking me if I'd ever done any um, porn video, and I said I hadn't, but I was I was open to it. I was kind of like you know experiencing uh, experimenting with bisexuality and kind of coming out with that. Um, I grew up. Pretty much presuming I was straight, and that's a, another thing. You know, it's kind of um, I have a divergent view on. Uh, I think most people are born with a strong tendency, one way or the other, towards heterosexuality or homosexuality, but just don't bother to experiment with the non-preferred gender. And so for me, it was kind of a conscious evolution. Not so much that I felt like I'd been in the closet and oh, I'm now just discovering that I like guys too, but but more a conscious decision to try this. And then once I kind of got past the initial weirdness of it, I found it very liberating. And, um, you know, so now I, I, although I'm physically still more attracted to women on average, you know, it's not like I would, you know, be more attracted to every woman than every man, you know, more depends on the individual. Um, but uh, yeah, anyway, one, you know, doing porn led to doing some more porn and, I worked for a little while in an adult theater here in San Francisco, like a male strip strip club kind of place, basically. Um, and uh, through there, I kind of realized like, oh, I can, you know, kind of get clients on my own and see them on the side. And then, you know, I really actually enjoyed doing that more than working in the theater. And really, I could just, you know, kind of hang out my shingle and, and you know, be independent. And uh, that's what I did. Yeah, that's uh, yeah, certainly uh, yeah, porn, you know, is uh, and you know, one thing we people don't want like to admit, but you know, porn has been a, a technical pioneer in a lot of areas. You know, pioneered VCRs, pioneered online video streaming, video streaming, yeah, I was just gonna think online payment cool. systems, so they could charge money for it. You know, I, I think yeah, maybe some other things, but I'm not sure. Um. Nothing's coming to mind immediately, but you know, there may well be. Yeah. Yeah, it's certainly a. Is there, is yeah, I there... see it as, as very 
um, you know, libertarian, individually empowering. Oh yeah. And, uh, and even spiritual, I, I find, I think sexuality is, is a beautiful spiritual thing. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, um, really unfortunate. I think that most religions have tended to go just the opposite to be very sex negative. Yeah. I, I don't know what's up with that. I don't know. You know, I, re I remember, you know, what Ayn Rand said, you know, she says not because sex is bad, but because it's too good and too important. You know, and that's that's why she that's why she was against promiscuity, though. She said it's too good and too important. You know, it's, <laughs> you know, which I which I think people uh, food, is, food is too good and too important. Therefore, I'm only going to eat, eat this one uh, thing yeah. and then only sporadically. No, that, that doesn't really make sense to me. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, well, you know, eating too much food can be unhealthy. You know, it's uh, you know, we got more people who are sick sure. because of too much food as opposed to because of too, too little food. Yeah. You know, but like anything else, if you if you like sports or you like traveling or you like yeah. gardening, you know, you don't tend to like limit yourself in those areas. Like, well, yeah. I really love gardening. It's so special. I'm only going to spend one hour a week doing it, even though I have time. I could do more time gardening, but, you know, it's just too special. No, that doesn't really make sense to me. Yeah, true. I know. I know what you're saying. You know it. You know, I can remember though. You know, when some, you know, back before the days of YouTube, you know, it was always, it was always kind of a treat to hear a song that I heard. You know, a song that I really liked and it came on the radio. It's like, oh, good, the song. You know, but it, but but when you can go get the song anytime, it's not doesn't seem as special. I know. Yeah, and <laughs> I, I, I sigh because I have a huge music collection, and I I do definitely feel like it's it's somewhat devalued now. But I haven't, you know, I probably inherited that from my parents i still can't divulge myself of my my music collection even though i can find most of it online if i just look on youtube or whatever but yeah. um travel's kind of like that too i mean it used to be like well you know if you want to really see someplace i mean you have to go out and either go there yourself or you find you know go yeah. research somewhere in books or whatever to find pictures of this place and read about it and now it's like you just you know go to google earth or whatever and yeah. find see anything in the world you want to see immediately um yeah it, you know i i came up with my 50 show rule on this and i said i won't invite anybody back until i do fit to until i've done 50 shows so you know so if they if they did show number five they won't come back until 55 and i just said you know i don't i don't want to these people might be great guests but they won't be as special if i have them on too much you know it's you know, so i think it kind of does do but it, but it does depend on the things you're doing with the people you're doing it with. Well, yeah, I have to sort of realize like, okay, yeah. well, the, the people that you're broadcasting to, it's not like the only thing that they're watching or listening to is, is your show. They could be out there listening to these people the rest of the time, or they, they could be, you know, never listening to people except on your show. Oh, yeah. So it's, um, and I, and I want to have some variety on here. You know, I've had some, yeah yeah because i because uh yeah you know I, I so did you did you grow up in san francisco or, or do you yes, in the bay area. Uh -huh. okay so you've always been in the bay area uh well no i haven't always been here um okay. I, i've been lots of different places but i've always this has been where i've lived long term uh which i i make that distinction because i do think people tend to think of it like well you know I live in this place. It's like, well, no, you live wherever your body is at any given point, you know, in the day. Yeah. So, like if I fly to Pittsburgh, then I'm going to be living in Pittsburgh for the next yeah. hour, many hours or days or whatnot. Um, yeah. You'd say I reside in San Francisco. Yes. Well, you reside yeah. where, <laughs> wherever you are uh, again, but uh, as far as having, you know, if you have a residence, you know, that's different. Yeah. Um, I have a residence well, in San Francisco. I don't have a residence in Pittsburgh or wherever else I might fly. You know, I might. Yeah, well, well there. You, you know, it's like what, what somebody put on Tommy Lasorda's epitaph or something like that. It said Dodger Stadium was his address, but every ballpark was his home. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because well, he I, loved baseball, you know. He, yeah. One of my uh, kind of controversial beliefs that sort of relates to that is I think actually people should be able to vote wherever they are. 
you know, if you care enough about some place to go and, and vote there and the elections there, um, you know, you should be able to do that. Yeah. Uh, would you uh, would that would that lead to people voting in multiple locations, though, or not? Um, it could. I mean, if, if somebody cared enough about public policy, they want to go spend all their time traveling from jurisdiction to jurisdiction to vote. And I would also tend to ban, you know, vote by mail. I think I think voting should be uh, done in person, um, you know, unless someone is, is registered as being bedridden or something. And even then, I tend yeah. to feel like it should be yeah. in person, like somebody should come to them and take their vote rather than having vote by mail or electronic yeah. voting. I don't I don't think these systems are, are trustworthy. Um, I yeah, think I, I, you know, I, I, I really, I really get irked when I hear, I think it's because my mother worked the polls for many, many years. Uh, and when people bring up the issue of voter ID, I just, I just think back to when mother was working the polls and all these other ladies who were working the polls with her. And it's just, you know, we had a small precinct. Everybody knew who everybody was. Nobody asked for ID. Because everybody knew who everybody was. And we've got, I think it's troubling that we've gotten away from that. That's one thing that I think is troubling is that we've gotten away from that. Well, that that obviously wouldn't work with my approach of yeah. letting people vote wherever. And yeah. I, I think, you know, most people are, are horrified by that idea. But yeah. I think part of that is that I think there's still such a strong, uh, you know, nativist kind of uh uh, and it's again, it's a it's understandable in human terms. This is how humans evolved. You know, we we live with for thousands of years, small nomadic groups where everybody did know everybody and, and strangers were threats and enemies and so forth. Um, yeah. But, yeah. you know, it, it's 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 fundamentally not just I mean, if, if like San Francisco, people say like, well, it's it's only 49 square miles. You can't have everybody. You know, no, nobody has a right to live in San Francisco. And I agree, nobody has a right to live in San Francisco. But um, just because I've been here a long time doesn't mean that I have more rights yeah. here than somebody else who has never been here before. In fact, maybe if you want to just look at it in terms of justice, if there's not enough supply to meet demand, maybe, you know, maybe I need to leave. Maybe it's somebody else's turn to be here, you know. Yeah. Um, Obviously, I don't think anybody should be forced to leave either, but just just let the market handle its supply and demand. Uh, mm -hmm. But there's all these things from, you know, anti-immigration laws and sentiment to buy local campaigns to people, you know, rooting for their quote unquote sports team, even though the people on that team may be from all over the place and really have no connection to their community. They just they feel this parochial sense in it. Um, and I'm I'm opposed to that kind of parochialism. I don't think that um, it is uh, logical or rational or um, you know sound basis for public policy. I mean, by by local, it's like, well, why should? I mean, there, there are some environmental well, reasons why all all else being equal, by local might be a good thing. Um, yeah, I, yeah. I'm not. I'm not saying that there's never a reason to favor like locally grown produce. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, but, yeah. But, you know, just because like a company or, or seller is located nearby geographical proximity has nothing to do with, you know, quality or deserving, you know, how deserving yeah. someone is. Uh, well, I don't feel more affinity with somebody in, <clears throat> you know, living in San Francisco than somebody living in Tijuana or New York City or whatever. Um, yeah. But, you know, if I, local. but, you know, let's say I have, I, I, I'm a doctor and I have my doctor's office and I go down to the, I go down and shop at the local hardware store. And then the owner of the hardware store comes to, for, to me, shop with me at the doctor, you know, the money, it, it keeps the money local. And, and, you know, and, and, you know, with regard to something like food, you know, what, you know, food is perishable. Why, why, why would I want food? Why would I buy apples from somebody who's a thousand miles away when I could buy apples from somebody who's five miles away and, and the apples are going to be fresher and there's less transportation costs, you know? 
yeah well if all those things are true yeah. i agree i mean if you you know if the guy that runs the hardware store or the gal is your friend um, yeah you know it's yeah. friendship is yeah. worthwhile and it's it's nice to reciprocate with your friends and that kind of thing but you know if it's just geographical proximity and nothing else well you know maybe the apples that are grown out of state are actually better quality or a different variety that you can't find or yeah. you can't grow locally or something that they and they might be but there's also you know, they also might be but also but as i pointed out too because food is a perishable item they may not get here fresh you know uh, i mean well technology is, is largely addressing that problem it hasn't yeah. you know completely eliminated it but you can you know, yeah. stuff ship to you from all over the world it'll be you know just as fresh pretty much yeah. uh, um do the miracles of uh you know what do they call it uh on on demand ordering or there's a term for this in the business world but um i just feel that that parochialism causes yeah. so many problems i mean it, it's it's at the root oh, yeah. of things like nationalism and, and nationalism yeah. causes so many so many conflicts yeah. and wars um oh yeah N nativism is something i i really and it really bothers me you know and you know you know when you know going back to you know when we were talking about ronald reagan ronald reagan was very popular with immigrants and ronald reagan liked immigrants Mm -hmm. And I don't know where, especially on the, you know, on the, on the red team got this, this hatred of immigrants that just came out of, I, I, I you know, I blame it part, I blame it largely on some pe people like Pat Buchanan, but you know, it's, mm -hmm. and, and I don't know where they, and it's just, it, it, it's really. Well, there was always that, you know, there's always been that strain in, in the United States so long. I mean, I think just about everywhere, there's always, um, you know, tends to be some degree of, of nativism. Um, yeah. I, I think uh, the change in, yeah. in immigration laws contributes to it. I, th I think racism is a factor that like when yeah. more people started coming from uh, non-European countries, yeah. that uh, more people turned against immigration for racist reasons. And there was a big shift with that in, I think, 1965 when they had a major... U.S. government uh, immigration reform that, uh, you know, allowed more people to come from other countries that were non-traditional sources of migrants to the United States. Well, as I think that played a role. This one person pointed out NAFTA ended up flooding Mexico with a lot of a lot of cheap or cheaper American food. So it put a lot of small farmers in Mexico out of business. So that's so they ended up coming here. So so if we had, you know, I, I mean, so many cases, too. A lot of this immigration is because America is the, the American government has done something that's that's screwed their country up. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I I think yeah, uh, you know, I, I'm I'm not a, I, I'm for more liberalization of, yeah. of trade. I, I, I think NAFTA yeah. was was flawed. I mean, yeah. but, but but not in terms of the trade liberalization aspects yeah. of it. Probably there were yeah. other laws in Mexico that were disadvantaging small farmers so that they couldn't compete. Yeah. But if they had proper laws, yeah. I think that, that small growers and, and sellers can definitely compete. True. Well, farming is also heavily heavily subsidized here i don't know how much it's subsidized in mexico it's uh there's a lot of factors involved you know well yeah and that's that's part of the problem is these these big agri businesses getting different yeah. types of subsidies and that's that's one reason probably they were able to outcompete small mexican farmers and so yeah. forth but like any any public space you know i call, call it the, the commons um the public spaces people should be able to freely buy and sell you should be able to go out oh, and yeah. sell goods for sale on the the sidewalk and not have to get any business permits or licenses oh, yeah. or pay taxes. Um, yeah. And if people have the freedom to do that, you know, they're going to be able to compete with the big sellers that have economies of scale yeah. because they're flexible. They can go where the customers are. There's any number of advantages there. And that's one thing I, I that's one thing I always notice when I go to Mexico is I, I see a lot of micro businesses as i i like to call them you know i mean I'm a business that you could start for probably a thousand or two thousand dollars i mean you'll see somebody have right. a trailer selling tacos or I, yeah. saw, I saw one guy you know had a little shop where had a little shop where he was making keys or, or you'll see a restaurant that maybe is the size of a two-car garage you know and they'll sell food out of yeah. that 
doesn't and this is more lot. common yeah. this is more common in a lot of countries in the united states yeah. a lot of this has been either just uh criminalized outright or, or regulated out of existence and this is oh, such yeah. a, a problem the institute for justice is doing great work uh on this issue by the way ij.org yeah. um standing up for uh you know the rights of people to operate their businesses without you know various licenses and overcoming restrictions and government zoning laws and everything that try to put them out of business or, or just, you know, create such barriers to entry that people can't start businesses in this area. Like, you know, you want to do certain types of cosmetology, you have to go to cosmetology school, even though they don't even oh, God. offer any uh, training in the areas that you want to do, like African hair braiding. <laughs> you know, there's some, um, yeah, the well, legal see. system in this country is just so completely out of control and it's, it's created this morass. I feel like of uh, it's, it's all done that. And it's done that. And so, and, it, and it's done it. And so, and I agree. It's so wrong when you're, you, when you have to get permission to work for a living, you yeah. know, I, I, I actually know, I actually know the lady who lobbied the Texas legislature to start licensing massage therapists. And it was, uh, yeah. Uh, and she's a nice lady, but I'm just like, why did you, you know, what was the whole point of doing this? And she, she felt like it. She, she was a massage therapist herself who was yeah. already established, I'm guessing. I think she, I think she want, did it because she wanted to try to break it from this image of being prostitution. Uh, and that was why she, mm. it's what her reasoning was. I, I only heard the second hand, but it really does bother me when you get people who, yeah, obviously you're established and you end up creating this situation. I don't, yeah, it, it's not, it's definitely not good in my opinion. These people are licensed. There's no reason for it. I, there, there's, and yeah, licensing is an evil that uh, it, it impacts everything. It's, it, it, it's, it's a barrier between the customer and the, and the person selling the service. Yeah. I had a chiro, I had a great chiropractor and, uh, he's no longer alive, but somehow he lost his license. It's like, I don't mm. care. You do good work. You still, and he's still the same guy doing good work after that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. Licensing, zoning laws, and quality oh, yeah. committee, I think, are, are three really should be really big targets for you know, experience. That's, in terms one, of that's one thing, you know, zoning laws and stuff is let, let's talk about that for a minute. You know, you're in San okay. Francisco, which is largely one of the most expensive cities in America. Yeah. Can you tell us how, can you tell us how, uh, how and why is it so expensive to live in San Francisco? Uh, well, just, just starting with the physical, it is, you know, as I mentioned earlier, 49 square miles, it's, it's a limited yeah. geographic area, but yeah, you know, water in three sides, so you can't expand. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. But that being said, you know, there's so many places in the city that are un empty, unused or underused land that could be developed, uh, you know, if it wasn't for land use regulations. Zoning is a major factor. Like the whole the whole western side of the city in some ways is kind of like a, a suburb. There's a lot of, you know, one and two story uh, buildings, um, single family residences uh, where the property is not allowed to be developed into other types of uses. Yeah. Uh, this is starting to change. There's actually the YIMBY movement, uh, which stands for Yes in My Backyard. Yes in My Backyard, as opposed to Not in My Backyard. Exactly. Yimby, it's yes. the, it's the, the YIMBY movement. I love it. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I was, um, you know, quite supportive of that. I mean, it's kind of, well, it, the, the, the great thing about the YIMBY movement that I was really enthused about is that um, it's the first time I've seen here a populist movement made up largely of young people uh, that is advocating for more economic liberty. Um, they, they are not generally libertarians. They don't get it on other issues. Most of them are still fine with uh, things like rent control um, and, uh, you know, licensing and <laughs> taxes and so on and so forth. But at least when it comes to housing, there is a strong recognition among Yimbis that this is an issue of supply and demand. Yeah. And we just need to allow more housing to be built that government regulations have inhibited and restricted the construction of new housing and made it more expensive and that this needs to change. Yeah. So I think that is a very healthy development mm -hmm. that at least on this narrow issue, 
that there is a populist uh, movement. And I would say the MB movement is, yeah, it's, it's a populist movement and it's yeah. largely young professionals who are involved with it. And they want more economic liberty in this area. They, they understand that zoning laws are uh, making it impossible for many of them to be able to afford to buy a house in this area. And yeah. they want to do something about that. It, it's, it's also great to see that somebody understands that this is expensive. And so they're asking, why is it expensive? And then they're yeah. actually looking at, oh, and instead, and instead, whereas in other things, it's like, this is expensive. The government should pay for it. Yeah. You know, and and sadly, if, they, you know, if you want everybody to have something, create conditions that make it cheap, you know, and, yeah. you know, and, and, and ask yourself, why is it so expensive? But I do think they probably shows in housing because, you know, they know that houses are cheaper in other cities. So that, so they, they so that it is kind of hitting them and saying, yes, well, let's look at that. I think that's great. Yeah. You know, building codes and zoning laws. Yeah. It's a, yeah. Yeah, and and just uh, the land use policies. Uh, neighbors yeah. have been empowered to block and and throw up hurdles and delays for almost any kind of change yeah. that anybody wants to have. Um, and then then when they sometimes do bypass that, they do it in the wrong way. Like in, in during COVID, uh, they started. Uh, it had been a trend of a few years before that to, to have these things called parklets. I don't know if this to what extent this is. What a park in other parts of like a small a park, park or what? Um, a parklet <laughs> was uh, basically um, a, a street uh, parking space. You know, usually in a commercial district that. Uh, had been converted into like, you know, a little hangout area. Um, you know, they'll put in tables of chairs, you know, maybe some yeah. some barricades around it, this kind of thing. Uh, sometimes, you know, they might have uh, grass or whatever. Uh, but it'd be a little space that was basically sort of reclaimed as, as you know, public hangout space from the street. And um, And so there were some of these things before COVID. But then during COVID, because of the, the indoor thing, um, a lot of, uh, you know, restaurants wanted to be able to op operate outdoors. And they started letting, uh, you know, more restaurants sort of colonize more street spaces this way. Um, but the original law with parklets was they had to be uh, open to the public. You know, you couldn't uh, restrict people from using the parklet, uh, even if your business, you know, paid for the, the stuff in it. Uh, you couldn't restrict it to only customers. Uh, but now, now restaurants, uh, primarily restaurants and bars, are doing this. Um, they're taking over these street parking spaces that was part of the commons, you know, the land that belongs to everybody, and they're basically colonizing it for part of their business. Um, and the city government's been letting them do this because now they're starting to charge uh, fees for these spaces. You know, so they're using it as a way to to take more money from the businesses and bring in extra revenue. Um, at the same time, the the businesses are taking extra space away from the public. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's a problem, <laughs> even though I, I, the businesses in many cases are struggling and I, I, you know, I think it's nice that they have other opportunities to make money. And, and, you know, in many cases, it's nice to have the outdoor spaces, but I don't think they should be allowed to take them over and exclude non-customers. You know, this yeah. is public land and, and then anybody should be able to go and be in these areas. Well, um, they're buying something or not. I, I, I sense that San Francisco is a very car hostile city. Oh yes, yeah, <laughs> that's, uh, that's a fair statement. Uh, that they just yeah, so they're happy to say, oh, we'll just rip out, we'll just you know get rid of these parking spaces because I can imagine, you know, what does it cost to park my car in San Francisco? I don't think I want to know. Yeah, well, it, it very much depends where it, you are. I mean, some well, places. Well, let's say downtown San Francisco. But yeah, or downtown. Per day, you know, no, probably yeah. it's probably as bad as Manhattan or is Manhattan or something place like that. I bet. I'm not sure. You know, I don't. I don't actually own a car. I haven't owned a car here for years. When I did, I was getting too many parking yeah. tickets. It was ridiculous. Oh yeah. Well, yeah. There's a lot. There's a lot. Probably a lot of a lot of people who just live without a car in San Francisco. I suppose. Yeah. yeah. Um, but you're right. It is it is unfortunately very um, anti-car. And that that was part of what enabled this to happen with with the parklets. There's like nobody yeah. really organized standing up for, uh, you know, 
defending against the loss of, of public parking spaces. And um, then there's all these other things, you know, they put in one way streets and street barricades. Uh, recently, they barricaded yeah. these one street uh, in the mission near where I live uh, to try to stop street prostitution. Um, you know, they'll have red painted lanes that only buses and taxis can use. Oh, yeah. uh, there's just there's a lot of unnecessary yeah. street regulations and yeah signage yeah. and restrictions and then they don't pave the streets you know they're full of potholes um yeah. <laughs> which is worse There's... for me as a bicyclist instead of having all the bicycle lanes i'd rather get them just you know get rid of the potholes and, and clean up the glass in the streets and stuff like that oh, yeah. you know yeah you know and, and i've said this though and, and you know it's and it seems that way here in austin because it's almost as if they want to make they just want to make owning a car so unpleasant that people who like their cars leave or or people or that they just give up you There's know a lot of people that's exactly what they're trying yeah. to do and you yeah. know i think and you know but you know as you pointed out the potholes don't help bikers no <laughs> you know you know you're a bicyclist and uh, oh man that's got to be yeah. biking in san francisco has got to be a workout there too though because san francisco is not a flat place <laughs> yeah well that's how i keep my ass looking nice <laughs> <laughs> yeah good for you yeah i mean yeah, yeah yeah it's so you know if you got a lot of bikers i mean you, you never see any you don't see any fat biker bicyclists you know because you got because it's always a workout you know it's a yeah and you know I, do you ever get to a point where you maybe want to use a car to go somewhere or do you just oh sure sure i mean there's places where you know yeah it's not convenient to bike and yeah well, like not, I say, if, if you know, an object, I would, I would have a car if I had a place to park it and yeah. stuff. But um, yeah, for, for out of town trips anyway, most local trips, I don't need one, and, and it would just be an extra hassle. But yeah, uh, the other the other thing too is, that San Francisco is a, well, unlike Los Angeles, San Francisco is a big city before the car, and and, and if it was a big city before the car, it's definitely you know been acclimated to not having cars because everybody's you know people just have you know just never bothered to get them it's kind of you know passes down that way it's a I, i've not been in san francisco so I, but it's probably something a yeah. place i should visit just to experience it's, 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 it's worth checking out. there's there's a lot of history here even libertarian history um but yeah it's 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 it had a pretty unique history as an area and it's just geographically blessed. I mean, you've got the beaches, the redwoods, you know, the mountains nearby, the, you know, wine country. There's just, there's so much here. Um, yeah. And, and, the, really and, the, and the port, of course, it was a natural port. And so, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, talking about, you know, there was certainly, a, you know, talking about nativism, there was certainly a lot of prejudice against Asian immigrants in, in California in the past. I don't this know if it's still that way. But... This is where the first anti-immigrant law, the Chinese Exclusion Act. Yes, uh, exactly. One other one, a uh, minor one before that. I can't remember the name now. But, yeah, that that sadly started in, in San Francisco. Um, and, uh, you know, it's... Um, there's been it's been a lot of a lot of cultural stuff, both good and bad, that's come out of this region. I mean, you know, on the positive side, you know, we've had Burning Man started in San Francisco. Uh, you know, of course, the whole Silicon Valley was, you know, Greater Bay Area, but a lot of that, you know, energy was coming from SF. The, the Summer of Love, the hippie movement, you know, was really ground central for that. Um, LGBTQ stuff, you know, having a, Harvey Malk, the first prominent elected official who was out and openly gay. And yeah. before him, a couple other seminal figures, you know, people don't know about, like Jose Saria. He was the first um, openly gay person to run for public office in the United States. Yeah, you, you weren't in San Francisco during the Harvey Milk era, were you? No, no. Yeah, yeah I know. Of course, there were some other, uh, other, uh, other prominent libertarians. <sighs> Where, yeah. Where well, even the Libertarian Party used to be headquartered here. I mean, yeah. Murray Rothbard lived here. Milton Friedman lived here. You know, there, well, also the laissez fair books. books. What's that? But laissez fair books had their location there. Right. Laissez fair books was here. International mm -hmm. Society for Individual Liberty. Yeah. And uh, Ju Justin yeah. Raimondo. Right. Antiwar.com. Yeah. yeah Ju Justin Raimondo actually talked about. Uh, participating is i know read somewhere where he, he actually also was participating in the protests when uh they 
basically gave Dan White a slap on the wrist. Mm-hmm. You know, Dan White was the guy who shot Harvey Milk. So right, right, and he shot somebody else too. But yeah, yeah, the mayor. But, yeah, but, yeah, he killed Mayor Moscone. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, the mayor. Oh. Yeah, and, and but, Dan White was a police officer, officer so we can't, we got we got to be we got to go easy on him because he was a police officer. He was a former police officer, and he was a an elected city supervisor, you yeah. know, and and went and committed double murder. So, yeah, yeah, just uh, lots of uh, you know one more example of ethically challenged uh, politicians. Yeah, you you know the other interesting thing about Harvey Milk though too was he actually started in, in, in his early days. He was a part of the red team. Yep, he was in the Navy and uh, yeah. conservative. Uh, yeah, they didn't call it red team back then, but uh, yeah. Yeah, I I prefer to say red team or blue team as opposed to. I, I assume you've seen the movie. How historically accurate is that movie? Because sometimes they take milk? liberties with certain movies. The, yeah, the movie about yeah, milk. I think that was pretty accurate as okay. far as what I know. Again, I wasn't there personally yeah. for that history, though I did know some of the people. You know, like in the movie. Yeah. I mean, Den- Dennis Brown was. Uh, yeah. Uh, portrayed in the movie he yeah. he was the guy more than anyone else you know who was responsible for um i think cannabis legalization in this country the yeah. extent to which that's progressed dennis brown was the, the main author of uh, prop 215 in in yeah. 1996 which decriminalized uh, medical marijuana in california yeah. well well, what, well that, he'd been running a dispensary locally you know black yeah. market basically um you know he was a, a gay man and um you know was helping people with aids you know having access to marijuana he and yeah. brownie mary um uh running this uh dispensary which you know the local officials just kind of turned a blind eye to it because they knew it was popular and it was yeah serving a need you know they didn't uh they didn't have the political head spot to try to crack down on it and and prop 215 and everything else that followed kind of grew out of that you know so so we have uh you know him to thank and steve cubby played a, a role yeah in, who was a, a libertarian um you know ran for governor here and stuff yes we uh yeah you can uh, go back and listen to our we had a little uh we had a nice uh tribute panel uh for steve cubby right on yeah that, i believe that was either 26 or 29 i i did cubby and i did badnarik and they were 26 and 29 uh i did one for michael badnarik as well yeah cubby right. cubby was awesome yeah also uh uh, did you speaking of medical marijuana and AIDS? Did you know uh, Peter McWilliams? Uh, Why well, I, I saw him and met him at the Libertarian Party convention. Uh, I forget yeah. what year that was, but um, he was from uh, I believe L.A. area, if I'm remembering. I, I could I be wrong about that. there too. Yeah, um, but yeah, I didn't I didn't know him personally before you know encountering him through the movement. No. Yeah, he was. Yeah, I didn't know him too, but that was another tragedy because he was using medical yeah. marijuana, and, uh, and yeah, it was kind of unfortunate the way he was harassing him. But like he said, ain't nobody's business if you do. So, yeah, the title of his book. That was that was how you look at it. Yeah, it's a, it's, it's, it's very interesting. By not having not having access to that, he yeah. he, he died as a result. And uh, exactly, yeah. one more victim of government. Yeah, it was. You know, and uh, you know, speaking of uh, you know. AIDS and stuff. And uh, do you have an opinion on the movie Dallas Buyers Club? Uh, I have not seen that. Oh, that's that is a great libertarian movie, and it's a right on. You know, deals with an AIDS patient, and and you know what's interesting about that movie because the protagonist is an AIDS patient, it got a lot of sympathy on the left, but it didn't get a lot of sympathy from conservatives, even though it's very much a pro-capitalist movie. Interesting. Um, that came out a while ago, didn't it? Yeah, I think it was 2012. Matthew McConaughey, he got quite a few awards for it. Uh, yeah, it was a, yeah, it was a, nice. Jennifer Garner's in it as well. Yeah. Yeah. I wasn't sure you if know, you saw that or not. Yeah. It's something interesting. Uh, you know, I mean the, the war on drugs, I think, uh, continues to crumble, even though there's, there's, you know, countervailing forces to I was very disappointed a few years ago here they San Francisco majority I think it was like 70 percent of people voted to criminalize um, s- selling flavored tobacco products um that's like haven't you don't you people realize the war on drugs doesn't work like you'd think after all this time and, and and other things but when it comes to politically unpopular drug like tobacco people are still willing to vote for prohibition uh 
it's very sad. Yeah. But but on the the bright side, um, the movement to decriminalize psychedelics is really making gains. Uh, the decriminalized in Oakland and uh, state of Oregon now. Yeah. And, um, and in Oakland, they just opened um, well last year uh, a, a church that is um, distributing uh, you know psychedelics to members. And they were they were raided last summer, um, and now the church is suing the uh, Oakland Police Department over that. And um, they've opened up uh, one in San Francisco. Um, so it'd be interesting to see what happens with this. The pastor is very brave. He's openly acknowledging, you know, his risk. He may go to federal prison for what he's doing, and he's willing to take that risk. He believes in the issue, feels it's that important. So. Um, yeah, um, psilocybin mushrooms and uh, ayahuasca and peyote and other, you know, um, psychedelics like that. Uh, I think the prospects for getting some of the laws off those kind of things are pretty bright right now, yeah. uh, making it, progress. It's so weird when, you, you know, you talked about the war on cigarette smoking. And I, I have to say, I, I don't necessarily... You know, I look at the war on cigarette smoking. It does seem kind of silly, but at the same time, I don't mind going out to public places and not being subjected to it. But it really is. But, it, you know, I, a lot of there are a lot of smokers out there who really are thinking that someday cigarettes will be completely outlawed. I And I, I wouldn't be shocked if they are. Things have sadly been moving in that direction. And like you, I, you know, I don't smoke cigarettes and I don't like the smell yeah. of them. That yeah. tends to give me a headache and. I remember gr growing up, like I often, you know, yeah, yeah I like having been in all the smoky environments. But, um, you know, I've I've gotten to the point where, like, I see someone smoking in violation of the law, I may go over and congratulate them, yeah. <laughs> you know, or thank them for breaking a bad law because it's, oh, it's yeah. like I also got to the point where just like seeing, even if it's a a, a cause I disagree with, there's something um you know heartwarming about seeing a public protest that's yeah. violating you know uh rules requiring them to have permits or whatever it is yeah. you know if they're engaging in civil disobedience even if it's for yeah. a bad cause there's something healthy about that they're pushing it back against uh against power well you know i was i you know i was talking to people said you want to organize anti-mask flash mobs you know like we like where we all sh like 10 people show up at Walmart at one at once, not wearing masks and we all go in, you know, something like that, you know, it's like, just to kind of, as a protest, you know, you know, obviously yeah, no, that, it doesn't have the effect, but if you have 10 people. Kind of thing is, is great. I, I love to yeah. see libertarians doing yeah. that kind yeah. of thing. Like, I, uh, uh, yeah, it's, a uh, yeah. The last time I saw public smoking was actually in a restaurant in Bratislava. I was in Slovakia and you're still, people still smoking publicly there, but that's, I haven't seen it since then. So you just never see it anywhere. It's a. Well, when you say public smoking, you mean in some indoors establishment? Yeah. Indoor in, in indoor in a, in, in a restaurant. Yeah. In, mm. Yeah. I mean, yeah. And, and you know, I, I remember when I was born, I mean, about, about the only places you couldn't smoke. Well, you couldn't smoke in school. You couldn't smoke in church. Hospitals, and, I mean, and you, and you couldn't smoke in the doctor's office. Actually, I think you could smoke in hospitals back then, but yeah, yeah, that, those are about the only places. The doctor, uh, I remember the doctor's office. The yeah, right. So um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So up on two hours here. I guess. Yeah, yeah, we are. Yeah, it's been a, it's been a very interesting. There's stuff you wanted to. I know we've gone all over the place. Was there some stuff you wanted to specifically ask me about? Uh, uh, you haven't gone to yet, or is it well? Where do you where where do you think you know? You know, we we did we we didn't you know we kind of got off the top of nativism, but you know, I, I the other thing that bothers me about nativism is I I, I don't want a wall put up because I want to be able to leave. Oh yeah, I mean border walls work both ways, and that's yeah danger people often don't realize. And and this country, I mean, the government already uh, basically extorts money from. If you want to leave, yeah. you have to buy a passport, you know, and and they limit how much money you can take out of the country. Um, and yeah, everything, so everything that is set up to be used against criminals is eventually used against people uh, or against people who, who who break the law. Is eventually used against people who obey the law. 
or they just expand the law so you're not yeah. breaking it anymore. Um, yeah, I mean, I, Rand I, had a great quote about uh, that, about, how, yeah. you know, we're not Boy Scouts you're up against here. You know, we want people to break these laws. There's no way to control innocent men. We want oh, laws yeah. broken, and then you can control people. So, yeah, you know, the, the same, uh, you know, it was the same observation that Katniss Everdeen made in The Hunger Games. Who doesn't break the law? You know, it's like we all, we break the law all the time because we have to, you know. Yeah. And in her case, you know, it was just going out and hunting illegally or whatever, or, you know, this, yeah, yeah, it's funny how this stuff gets just driven underground. Yeah. What do you, before we go, what, what do you think is the future of your city? Uh, I mean, well, well, with, that's shop, with things like, you know, going easy on shoplifting and stuff like that, where, where, where's it going to go? Well, to some extent that's, I mean, it, it's, it's an exaggerated by people on the right for political purposes, you know, San Francisco. I, I feared that. The yeah. boy of the, the right wing. Um, there's, there's elements of their critiques and so forth that are true. And there's others that are not, I mean, the shoplifting is a state law. Um, and it's not like it's, you know, it, it is still enforced, but also, I mean, you have to realize San Francisco has like such a huge wealth disparity. It, I, I think it's actually somewhat surprising that we don't even see more petty crime, more property crime than exists because you have, I mean, there's like 8,000 people roughly according to the official count who are homeless on the streets, like year in, year out. It's been hovering around that number for years now, um, despite the fact that they spend hundreds of millions of dollars a year on programs and services and bureaucracy and supposedly stuff to help the homeless. Um, as much as perhaps even a, a, a billion dollars by some estimates uh, is out of a city budget that's $14 billion approximately, which is bigger than the budgets of many entire U.S. states. Uh, you know, again, for 49 square mile area. So yeah. <laughs> they all this money, they can't they can't keep people housed. They can't keep the streets properly paved. Um, but, uh, you know, at the same time that there's all this homelessness and there's, uh, you know, again, I, I think there's many more. 8,000 8, is almost certainly an undercount of the, the real number of homeless in the area. Um, and there's many other people who are, are working poor, um, you know, living marginally, et cetera. And then on the flip side, as you mentioned earlier, it's it's just about some of the most expensive real estate in the country. Um, you know, the, the median income here is, is very high, it's, you know, um, homes go for, you know, millions of dollars. Um, and so when you have that kind of wealth disparity, I mean, you know, go back in history, the French Revolution, right? I mean, uh, I think that there's, uh, and, and couple that with, you know, the, the ec economic sort of climate in terms of the, the political views on it, you know, leftism, the anti-car, you know, hating on billionaires and wealthy people. Um, you, would, you would expect there to be a fair amount of, of shoplifting and, and petty crime, and, and there is. Um, it's not true that it's completely ignored and, and tolerated, but um, you know, with with the um, the laws being what they are, in some cases, I think some stores have taken uh, you know a policy of like, well, we can't can't really go too forcefully after shoplifters in terms of trying to apprehend them because we'll end up getting sued. It'll cost us a lot more money, that kind of thing. Um, you know, of course, there's very strong anti-gun laws here. Um, you know, nobody really dares to try to defend their property with with a gun. You'd get in worse legal trouble. Um, yeah. Although there was a very high-profile incident here recently uh, that produced a lot of protests and so forth. There was a shoplifter, a trans man, who um, tried to take some things out of a Walgreens store and uh, was... Um, blocked by a security guard. Um, they tried to push their way out. The security guard basically at that point became very aggressive, they, like physically tackled them, like threw them on the ground and so forth. Eventually let them up. Um, the person who was a black trans man, uh, you know, the security guard is also um, uh, African-American, I believe. But anyway, they, um, you know, the security guard kind of followed the person out of the store um, the shoplifter turned around and spit on them and then started uh, backing away and the security guard had already drawn their weapon. They shot and killed them with one shot. 
Um, so yeah, basically executed for attempting to shoplift about $14 reportedly worth of stuff. Um, there's been a big community backlash over there. The, the newly elected DA who's really been bad. Uh, we had a, a pro civil liberties reform DA who was really more focused on, uh, you know, violent crimes, not prosecuting people for victimless crimes that I and the Libertarian Party had supported. Uh, he unfortunately got recalled as part of this whole, you know, backlash against, you know, the perception of, of too much permissiveness with crime. And now the DA is very, um, law and order oriented and, and basically refused to charge the security guard with anything, even though when she finally under pressure released the video, it was pretty clear that the shooting was unjustified. The person was backing away when they were shot. Um, you know, there wasn't a, a threat. Um, now, what was your question again? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, well, I just wondered, where's, where's San Francisco going? You know, is it? Oh, yeah, you're right. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I figured the, the right was exaggerating some things, but, you know, you know, but obviously, you know, some people I've, I've certainly talked to people who have left, you know, who have left the city. Uh, oh, there's a been a lot of people, lot of people come here to Austin. The experience have left the city. Yeah, it's, it's definitely, um, you know, it, it is a very anti-business climate. Um, certain parts of the city, there's a lot of uh, uh, car break-ins, um, you know, that yeah. that's real. Uh you know, there's a lot of uh, obviously homelessness. There's there's open air drug use. Uh, that's all true. Although again, it, it tends to be concentrated in certain areas. But yeah. you know, the Tenderloin district, you can walk down the street. Yeah. There's like tents all over the place. And people sleeping on the streets. People yeah. sleeping on the sidewalk, taking drugs on the sidewalk, shooting up. Um, there seems to be, you know, the open air drug use and drug selling is one of the things that people uh, seem to get the most upset about, the law and order types, um, yeah. which is really ironic because, uh, you know, it's like when you think about it, okay, homeless people, I mean, a lot of people end up homeless because they have drug issues, but even if they didn't have a drug issue when they became homeless, um, you know, the stresses, uh, hardship of living on the street and feeling so alienated from society and everything, uh, it tends to drive people to use drugs and there's that culture around it. And of course, if you don't have a home, you don't have a home to go inside to do your drugs. So you're going to be doing them more out in the public view. Um, and, uh, you know, people seem as a, Oh no, open air drug dealing. Like, well, you know, it's no more dangerous when it's open air than when people are selling drugs behind closed doors or doing them behind closed doors. And in fact, in many ways, it might be safer because at least if somebody passes out out in public, somebody might see them and be able to administer Narcan or something to keep them from overdosing or be more likely to get help. But um, it, yeah. it's, uh, it, it nevertheless seems to attract this real gut antipathy. And I think it, it comes down to just people don't like to see poverty. People don't like to see yeah. They don't like to see drug use. They want it swept under the, the table, um, you know, where they don't have to look at it. And there's there's a real ugly attitude um, that uh, sadly I think has been growing as, as a response to this, the city government's failure to allow enough housing to be available so that people have places to live. And so you have all these ple people on the street and, and there's been the growing backlash against this. And that was part of why the, the reform minded DA got, uh, got the boot. And now we have the law and order DA. Um, and it still, of course, hasn't done anything to fix the problem. It's just as bad as it was before. Oh yeah. Yeah. yeah <laughs> I know what you criminalization mean. is not going to solve anything. It's not going to make this problem go away. It's an economic issue. And, uh, as well as, um, you know, just a, an issue of sort of societal breakdown to some extent. And, and there's people who want to blame the, the left or blame the hippies or whatever for this. But uh, really, I don't think that has anything to do with it. Um, San, it yeah, it's interesting how San Francisco got long had that left wing image, though. I wonder I wonder how that started. I mean, it, it's, you know, why did hippies go there? Maybe it was because of Berkeley. I don't know. It's. Well, no, I think it really goes back to the city. I mean, the the gold rush is when the city really yeah. took off. You know, eighteen forty nine. Yeah. But but Before you didn't that, have a lot of those politics there. You know, during the gold rush. But yes. Well, I think you had the roots of it there, um, and by that I mean you had the beginnings of it being a very multicultural community. You know, there <coughs> in San Francisco from yes. all over the world for the gold rush. 
and um, and it was a very freewheeling atmosphere. There were there were parades of prostitutes up and down Market Street. I mean, there were um, yeah. the first topless bar that was much later in the 20th century. Um, you know, but North Beach was the first topless yeah. bar in, in the United States. Um, there was uh, a character called Emperor Norton. Uh, it's fascinating if you look him up. He was a an economic speculator who got rich and then went bankrupt, I think, trying to corner the rice market. And he kind of um, uh, had a mental breakdown. Uh, he reinvented himself, basically, as kind of a, a homeless person who was a, a like a character. He called himself the Emperor Norton, the first uh, emperor of the United States and protector of Mexico. And he would issue his own currency and make proclamations. And, and people started taking him seriously. It, 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 it became sort of a civic joke. You know, he would go around and restaurants would give him free meals and uh, people would honor honor him in uh, various ways. And, and when he died, there was, you know, thousands and thousands of people turned out for his funeral. And, uh, yeah. you know, he was kind of an early member, you could say, of the counterculture, you know, he was, he was somebody who, you know, later he would have been like a, a merry prankster or one of the, the hippies or somebody like wavy gravy or something. <laughs> but, you know, this is like yeah. in the mid to late 1800s. Em Emperor yeah. Norton lived from 1818 to 1880. Yes, I see. That's a. Yeah. And Jose Saria, who I mentioned earlier, who was a, a North Beach early drag queen and the first person to run for public office in the United States, who was openly gay, uh, called himself the Widow Norton. And he started a tradition of having annual pilgrimages to the Emperor Norton's grave uh, in Colma, which is like the sort of the, the city where they end up uh, uh, when they, San Francisco started getting crowded, they dug up all the bodies from the cemeteries and shipped them down to Colma, basically. And that's now the town with all the cemeteries. Oh, um, they moved. The, yeah, I don't, I don't know. If, has that been done in any other town? Man, that's crazy. They moved the cemeteries. It, it was kind of crazy. And there's actually park. There's a park along Haight Street where you can still see some of the old uh, headstones that were used for a retaining yeah. wall. <laughs> you know, well, I know, they, I know a lot of the cemeteries in Austin are full. Yeah, they're just, they're completely full. Nobody can, you know, the, the, you can't get another plot there. But that's about it. Yeah, it's and actually kind of kind of fittingly when you think about the you know the the issue of democide and all the deaths caused by government, uh, where City Hall is used to be uh, one of the cemeteries. You know, <laughs> yeah, San Francisco. Yeah, I, I've never heard of a place where they. Uh, 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 it's probably happened before, but I, that's the only place I've heard of where they actually started digging up the. The cemeteries, yeah. Well, you know, uh, you know, uh, you were in Reno. I don't know how. How do you feel about the direction of the Libertarian Party right now? Uh, well, you know, I, I I'm not in. I'm not supportive of it. I, I'm not a member of the Mises Caucus. I, I voted against taking the anti bigotry language out of the platform and the um, the pro choice language on abortion out of the platform. Um, that being said, I. I I don't think it's as bad as some people made it out to be. I don't think um, this is like a closet Republican takeover. Yeah. I think I think there was a lot of legitimate um, grievance uh, with the previous uh, leadership in not taking a strong enough stand against the COVID lockdowns and the COVID authoritarianism on vaccination and yeah. everything. Um, so I think part of it was backlash against that. I actually I have an article at thirdpartywatch.com, uh, George oh, yeah. Phillips site where I, yeah. I wrote a sort of analysis of this a little bit. Yeah. Um, I think also the online culture, I think has become very toxic in the way that people interact with each other when commenting. Um, I, that's what's bothering me too. I, I think, I think, I think the, the, the way we do social media now is not conducive to good, good, uh, good, uh, yeah. 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 It's, it's, it's like a bubble and people in this bubble, you know, yeah. think like, oh, being edgy and mean spirited is this sure. way to, to advance. And yeah. I don't think it is. Um, it's it, there's always been that way to a certain degree, but it's gotten to a point now where it's it's got it's gotten so easy to do that, that every that, that more and more people are doing it. You know, uh, this is not political, political at all. But I, I, you know, when I got my car, I actually, for whatever reason, had a second spare tire in the car. So I go out on Facebook Marketplace and I put this out and I said, okay, 
uh, you know, fifty dollars for the spare tire, you know, you know, just because I wanted to get rid of it. I put it on Craigslist too. But after I put that on Facebook Marketplace, I immediately get some comment. You must be really desperate for money if you're selling your spare tire. I'm like, no, I had two spare tires and I don't need it. And I don't want it occupying my trunk. It's like, you know, what's the... Yes, well, that that seems pretty mild compared to a lot yeah, of things people, but, see people but say that, to each other. But, but that's but, something like, that wouldn't have occurred. Mm. That's something that would not have occurred in the days of pre-social media. Yeah, no, I hear you. And I, I do think, yeah, the yeah. whole dust up in the LP with the Mises caucus and everything, a lot of it grew out of online feuding, you know, Nick Sarwark yeah. and Tom Woods and Jeff Dice yeah. and some of these people I feel like yeah. just got too ego invested. Oh, and yeah. just the left right thing spilling over into the party. And, uh, you know, it just yeah. it produced a, a, you know, needless fractionalism. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm all for, you know, vigorous debates yeah. and everything when we're debating issues and ideas that really matter but it's so much yes. of it is, when it's personality driven that's just useless that doesn't accomplish oh. anything it just sets our movement back and i think libertarians should be nicer to each other it seems like and, and you know what bothers me is i think some people take positions just to spite somebody else it's like well he's in favor of this so i'll be against it it's like, right yep yep it's about ideas it's not about people and and i've heard i didn't pay as much attention but a lot of people said, you know, when Nick started out, he was, when Nick Sarwark started out, he was great. And then people say, but by the last term, he wasn't so great. That's, that's what I hear from a lot of people. And I, I don't know well, what happened there, but yeah. It's a, there's lots more that could be said about yeah. all of this, but yeah. it is two o'clock. I actually need to go. Yeah. And you said, okay, you yeah. Yeah. Two yeah. Hours anyway, okay, so. yeah. The only other question, what I do have you have to be back again? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I was going to ask you, what do you think the Mises haters really want? But if you don't have time, that's fine. Yeah, that's too much to unpack in that. I think, you know. Um, yeah, okay. Well, this has actually been, I, I, I thought this would be a really good conversation. And that's why I wanted to bring you on here. Uh, we had really to you have me. Yeah, because you, ha you, have, you have some very articulate points to make and you have some very good viewpoints. So, I, And you've been around for a while. So I thought this would be a very... I, I just want to have interesting conversations and we need to have interesting conversations with people who want to have interesting conversations. So, yeah. 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 And, and yeah. Thanks okay. Well, they're definitely good. And yeah, well, important part of the yeah. Uh, please like the video or subscribe to the channel, follow the channel. And uh, I'm, we're on rumble odyssey YouTube right now. Uh, I'm Chris Baker. We are out uh, on go by my novel escape from the village. Yeah. We are out. Yeah.